Well, I think we could start here if we want to win the old violin. All right, why don't we all stand and we'll sing here. You ready to go up there? All right.
is relevant to the snow, and it's from the book of Job, and it is uh, chapter 37, verses 1 through 7, and it says, uh, speaking of God's majesty, at this also my heart trembles and leaps out of its place. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Under the whole heaven he lets it go, and his lightning to the corners of the earth. After it his voice roars, he thunders with his majestic voice. He does not restrain the lightning when his voice is heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise to the downpour, his mighty downpour. He seals up the hands of every man, that all men whom he made may know it. This is the mighty God that we worship today. <clears throat>
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace, for bringing us here this morning. We recognize that you are so powerful as this winter season is coming up and we have felt the cold and the snow once again and we remember that you are the one who changes the seasons yep. and you are the one who brings the snow who is in control of the weather mm. and we are reminded that you are the one who is in control of the earth the sun the moon the stars and everything in the creation and we give you the glory and we are amazed at your power and at the same time your goodness in providing us with what we need we know that if this earth was changed a bit and it was just a little hotter or a little colder we could not survive right but yet you care for your creation you care for your people and we give you thanksgiving for that lord we also thank you that you have sent your son jesus christ to pay the penalty for the sins of your people we thank you that he has redeemed your people. And we thank you that he rose from the dead, yeah. guaranteeing the resurrection unto life for those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for salvation, for eternal life, the free gift of eternal life. We thank you for spiritual life, and for your mercy shown towards sinners such as us. Lord, we ask this morning, help us to give you glory. Help us to learn from your word. We pray for your grace upon your churches of this land, that we would more conform to your word, that our hearts would be revived in our Lord Jesus Christ by the power of your spirit, and that your gospel would continue to go forth, we pray, for the salvation of souls, and most of all, for your glory, we pray. We pray for this land as well, that we would repent of our many sins as a nation, yeah. that we again would recognize your sovereignty, and that we would bow the knee and surrender to you as our king, which you are, the king of all creation. And we pray for that as well. We pray for us individually as Christians, forgive us of our manifold sins and struggles, and we pray that you would cleanse us in daily sanctification and draw us closer to you and we pray that this time this morning would be used for that we pray that our fellowship would be sweet today and pleasing in your sight and we pray this all for your glory in the name of our lord jesus christ amen this morning we can turn in the word of god to mark chapter number 11 for our scripture reading and we will be reading verses 1 through 11. Beginning in verse 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never a man sat. Loose him, and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way, and found the colt tied by the door without, in a place where two ways met. And they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, what do ye, loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees, and strawed them in the way. And they, and they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David, 
that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. Right, you may be seated this morning, and uh, what a privilege we have once again, brethren, to be gathered together, to uh, hear God's word together this morning, and I'm certainly looking forward to that, and another um, powerful text that we have before us this morning, and uh, been so good, hasn't it, brethren, to be together in the word of God, to, to learn more about our Lord and Savior as he walked here as the perfect God-man, and uh, that will continue here this morning. The Pelagian says that God does not have a plan or an intent for his purposes. The Arminian says that God has a general plan, but not a specific plan. And of course, God tries as hard as he possibly can. The Reformer says that not only does God have a plan, but it is a very specific and divine plan and encompasses all events in all ages and all of human history. And it's interesting to me to note, just as I was talking with Brother Dean and a couple of the other brothers this morning, just how specific and intricate God really is. And so what I want to do this morning is lay the groundwork for us, for our text. It's going to take a little while to get there, but there's some very important um, uh, uh, understanding that we have to have as we're leading up to the last week, as the Lord Jesus uh, makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. There are a lot of things that the Western mind really cannot comprehend unless we understand it again through a Jewish mindset. And so that's what we want to do this morning. We want to lay the groundwork. And, and we remember, brother, don't we, when the Lord God called Noah, the preacher of righteousness by his grace, he gave him a very specific plan concerning, a divine plan concerning the building of the ark. He said this, make thee an ark of gopher wood. And, you know, as you look at the, at, the, at the ark, it was very specific. It was designed very specifically, coming from the very mind of God himself. And we know the type that's there, the typology that's taking place there. This is why it was so important that as Noah and his sons were building the ark, that it was done precisely exactly as God said it was to be done. And we know that the wood that they used there, if you look at the type of it, is... Is it, it represents as a picture of condemnation. In fact, Hebrews 11 tells us that by which Noah condemned the world by the building of the ark. Rooms, the Bible says, God said, shalt thou make in the ark, and thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Pitch, of course, is a picture of God's salvation. The word pitch in Hebrew literally means atonement. This is the picture that God is drawing very specifically, very divinely as he's putting this all together. In fact, the pitch is that which kept out the waters of God's judgment and made the believers know and his family very secure. He says this, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Now you think we're having a, a conversation about math this morning. And uh, brother, could you pop that up? Because math is sometimes hard to follow along. So you didn't know when you came this morning, amen, you were going to have a you were going to have a lesson on, on math this morning. In fact, modern day shipbuilders will tell us, brother, that these are the perfect proportions for a large ship like God had Noah build. It's an amazing thing, something called the perfect proportion. And the perfect proportion is this length. And then uh, six times the width and ten times the height. And so I thought what we'd do this morning is a little quick math just to show you how specific and how divinely designed the ark really was. A cubit is 18 inches. You can see that I put that up there. God said that the ark was to be 300 cubits long. Again, keeping in mind, perfect proportion is length and then six times the width and ten times the height. So we're going to do some math this morning. Amen? So you see there, 300 cubits... You take that times 18, that gives you 5,400 inches, amen? You divide that by 12, and what does that give us? 450 feet. That was the length of the ark. We know this, brethren, for sure. 
Then he said, God told him that, that it was to be 50 cubits wide. So you take 50 cubits times 18, that gives you 900 inches. Divide it by 12, that gives you 75 feet. You take that times 6, again, keeping in perfect proportion, that gives you 450. Then he said, the height was to be 30 cubits. You take 30 cubits times 18, that gives you 540 inches. Divide that by 12, gives you 45 feet. We know it's 45 feet long. Taking, again, the perfect portion times 10, and you get 450. And here we have, again, this is the intricacy of God. He has designed things perfectly. The ark is no different. First, then we see the door, and we know what that's likened to in the, in the ark. That was a door that it's like the Lord Jesus typing him. The only way to salvation is through the door of Christ. There's no other ways. And that's interesting, too. If you go there and look, you'll see that Noah got the animals on the ark, and they were all on the ark. And the Bible says that God closed the door. This is the same with Christ. He's the only way. God is the one that opens salvation. God is the one that closes salvation. Then we have the three levels of course, that is a picture of the Trinity of God, the first, second, the third levels on the ark. All of it was typed perfectly according to God's perfect plan. This was not done by accident, brother. The Lord is very specific. You remember also when the Lord God called and chose the people of Israel to be a special people unto himself. He set his love on them and showed them favor far above all the other people upon the face of the earth, the Bible says. He gave them a very specific and divine plan in which they were to build the tabernacle. We go from the ark. Now we look at the Old Testament, the tabernacle. We don't have time at all to, to show you all of the figures that are there. But we can see the Lord Jesus Christ there specifically. He had them build the tabernacle precisely that they might worship him according to his divine design. Isn't that amazing? People worship God any old way they want to. In fact, if you look in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's a very specific way to worship God in spirit and in truth. And for sure, that, tent, that tabernacle was designed for that. In fact, God's divine design was so precise that no less than four times in holy writ, he said to them, in the hearts of all that are wise, I have put wisdom that they may make it all that I have commanded thee. God was not leaving the temple up to fallible men. When he had the temple built, it was very specific. The curtains had to be, every, everything was precise and perfect. And God said, I will give them men wisdom that they might not screw it up. And then, brethren, you say, well, Mike, Pastor Mike, what does it have to do with everything? After that, then, after the tabernacle was built, God then gave his people seven divinely designed feasts in which they were to keep. What I want us to do this morning is turn our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 23. You're going to have to keep your finger there because we're going to flip back and forth a couple of times. But I want you to see the intricacy of this. And you say, what does this have to do with what we're talking about? The Lord Jesus entering into Jerusalem It has everything to do with it, brethren. Again, God being very specific and very divinely guiding. Look what he does here. Look at Leviticus chapter 23. And I want you to notice whose feast they are. This is really important, brother. And again, God designing the ark, God designing the temple that he would call his people to worship him in a very specific way. He now gives to them these divine feasts. And I want you to see whose they are. Look what the Bible says there in verse number one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of who? The feasts of the Lord. This is important. Which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. We see here that these feasts that God gave to the children of Israel after he built the temple to come and worship him in the way that he desires, in the way that he wants perfectly. He says, these are mine. These feasts came from the very mind of God. And he passed them to his people that they might worship him as they ought to and again what does this have to do with our text this morning it has everything to do with our text this morning the seven annual feasts of israel were spread over seven months of the jewish calendar at set times and seasons again appointed by god there was a specific time that they were to do these things this was a specific way again god demanding his people worship him. The first four of the seven feasts occurred during the springtime. And so again, this is very important. Why is that important? We had the Passover, the, 11, the, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the First Fruits, and the Feast of the Weeks. These were the first four that were to be celebrated by the people of Israel as they worshiped God in the spring. And I want you to see this again, as I was talking with Brother Dean this morning, I am convinced in my heart of hearts 
that we can know exactly what day the Lord Jesus was crucified. There's no guessing, and it wasn't on Friday, because I'm a littlest, and I believe it has to be there three days and three nights, as the Bible says. So it could not have been on Friday. And if we follow the Jewish feast, if we follow the Jewish, the way that God commanded them to do, we know exactly when he was crucified, the exact day. We know this, brethren. Let me show you here in Leviticus 23. Again, keeping your finger there. Look at verse number 5. Verse number 5, very important information to us. Again, understanding as Jesus is going into Jerusalem, this will change everything. We will understand it from their vantage point. Look at verse 5. In the 14th day of the first month, even is the Lord's what? Passover. So the very first feast that they were to gather together, together for was the Passover, which is the 14th of Nisan. If you understand their months, which is different than our months, their first month was the month of Nisan, which is our month, April. <laughs> that's why many of us, brethren, that's why we keep, again, their calendars were a little bit different, but God specifically says that the Passover has to be kept on the 14th of Nisan, which would be the 14th of their first month. And then we look in the New Testament, again, flip with me if you would. Why is that important? God commanded them. Look at Luke chapter 22 again. Look at Luke chapter 22. Again, God designed this, brethren, as we're seeing Jesus enter into Jerusalem. We are going to really see the lights come on as we understand this from the Jewish perspective. Look at Luke chapter 22. Look at verse number 7. Look what the Bible says. And again, God commanded in the Levitical law that it had to be done on the 14th of Nisan. There's no question about it. Look at verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover, what? Must be killed. And so we see that there. Now, if you understand the 14th of Nisan, when the first three stars appeared on the 13th, which was Wednesday evening, and ended with the first three stars on the 14th, which was Thursday evening, the Passover lamb had to be killed. This is what the Bible says. And so in between Wednesday evening and Thursday is when the Lord Jesus Christ was, was actually crucified. Not on Good Friday, not on Friday. That's an impossibility. It is not possible because you can't get three days and three nights. Even if you, even if you can join yourself into partial days and partial nights, you're not going to get three nights. Brethren, it's not going to happen. So the Bible says very clearly here, listen, the 14th day of Nisan, the Passover must be killed, which is between the first sighting of the stars on Wednesday to the last on Thursday. So sometime in between there, the Lord Jesus Christ is crucified on the 14th of Nisan. Now, we're going to get into that much deeper. I'm giving you kind of a high-rise look here so that we understand what's happening. When Jesus went into the city of Jerusalem, his Time was appointed perfectly with all the feasts that we're going to look at, and all of them are represented and fulfilled in him. So the Passover, of course, as we know, the Passover lamb must be killed. Look at the second one. Look at Leviticus 23 again back there. Look at verse number 6. So in the 14th day of the first month, the even is the Lord's Passover. Look at verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat uh, unleavened bread. And so we see the second uh, uh, feast that's, that was commanded by God. It's the Passover. Then it's the feast of unleavened bread. And this, of course, pointed to the Lord's sinless life, brethren. This is the sinless Lamb of God who John said on two occasions, look, the Lamb of God was taking away the sins of the world. He's saying, look, the sinless Lamb is coming. Our Savior, our God is here. And that pointed to his sinless life. In fact, if you understand this, he was killed on the 14th of Nisan, on the 15th on the, on the hall, on the feast of the unleavened bread. You know where his body was at? His body was laying in the grave. And it's an amazing thing when you understand that. It was in the grave during the first days of this feast. Look here at 1 Corinthians. Again, New Testament commentary, inspired commentary on this. Look at 1 Corinthians Chapter 5, look what the Bible says here. Paul himself under the inspiration of God. Jesus being typed in the feast of the unleavened bread. His sinless body. His sinless sacrifice. Look what Paul says here in verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse number, number 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us. Look at verse 8. 
Let us therefore keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of what? Sincerity and truth. And so we see again here the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilling that, the feast of unleavened bread. We have the Passover, we have the feast of unleavened bread. We also have this morning, brethren, and we need to be so grateful to God for the feast of first fruits. Look back there at Leviticus again, the command of God. Look at verse number um, 10. Look at Leviticus 23. Look at verse number 10. Look what the Bible says. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheave of the what? The first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And ye shall wave the sheave before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. We see here again this command, this command of God that they were to come, they were to bring the, their first fruits in. And of course, we know what the Bible says concerning him. And again, we're going to look at this in more depth. But this is a general, this is, what do they call that, a 35,000 foot view of this thing? So that we understand what we're starting here this morning in this text and how important it is and how important God's timing, his precision, and his perfectness really is. You see that there. This is, of course... <laughs> The first fruits of the righteous is the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Bible says, amen, and teaches us that. He was resurrected on this very day in the Old Testament, that, that feast that was kept, that very day that they were keeping the old first fruits feast. The Lord Jesus Christ was the first fruits from the dead. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Look there, if you would, again, just giving this comparison, laying this out. This is why it's so important, brethren, as we look at our text to understand the intricacy of God, the utter... Um, perfectness of God in all of this in God's perfect plan look at 1 Corinthians 15 look at verse number 20 look what the Bible says there but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept for since by man death came by man came also the resurrection of the dead for as in Adam all die even so in Christ shall all be made alive look at verse 23 but every man in his own order Christ the first fruits Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. And so we see again here, we have the Passover, we have the, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, again, all typed in Christ, all fulfilled in Christ at his first coming. We have the Feast of the First Fruits. And finally this morning, brethren, as we finish up looking at the four that he's going to accomplish in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, his entrance into the city, we find there that the day of Pentecost. Look at Leviticus 23. Look at verse number 16 again here again. Just a quick history lesson on this stuff. It's very important. Even on, Look at verse 16. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number fifty days, and shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And that's what penna means. It means fifty. And so God here commands his people that after fifty days you shall, you shall uh, bring in, you shall, uh, you shall give to the Lord first of all. And of course, this is a great picture, brethren. You and I. This actually concerns you and I. Those of us who are Bible-believing Christians here. Those of us whom God has given His Holy Spirit to. This is the absolute important feast as we look at this, the day of Pentecost. Look at Acts chapter 2. This is God uh, prophesying and throw, showing through His Son that this would happen. That the church would be become that, uh, that instrument in which God will use, that living organism, if you will, that God will use to bring in the harvest, to bring in many souls, to save many souls from hell. Look here at Acts chapter 2, look at verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Look at here, the day of Pentecost, the feast of Pentecost, this is what it showed the people of God. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, a rushing mighty wind, and filled all the house, wherefore they were, uh, they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Again, this is what we're seeing. This is what we're going to see unfold. All of this, all of these transactions, these eternal transactions of God are being fulfilled as Jesus begins. As we're going to turn to our text, as Jesus begins his entrance into the city of Jerusalem. This is so important, brother, and for us to grab a hold of that. The final three feasts, I'll give them to you, but we're not going to look at them today. The final three are the Feast of Trumpets, 
God commanded them in Leviticus that they were to that they were blow of the trumpets. We know what that is likened to in the New Testament. Amen. It all has to do with the second coming. In 1 Thessalonians, the Bible says that the trumpet call of God. That, I mean, it's not very difficult, brethren, but it's very important, isn't it? The day of atonement, and I am convinced that Zechariah will be fulfilled. The day of atonement is when the Jewish people, God's people, will look. And the Bible says there in Zechariah chapter 13, it says, hey, there's a fountain. We sing it. We sing it. There's a fountain for the city of Jerusalem. There's a fountain for the, for the, for the, for the nation of Israel. They will look upon him whom they've pierced. That is literally tied in. The day of atonement is tied to the Jewish people as they will recognize their Savior uh, when he comes again. And finally, the tabernacles. All of these, brethren, again, occurred in the fall, which is, and they still celebrate them today in the fall. Again, all connected to his second coming, the Lord's second advent. All of which will be literally and rightly fulfilled on the actual feast day in connection with when he comes. This, brethren, this is why I laid all of this groundwork, brethren. This is why it's so important for us. Amen. This is why Mark, listen. This is why Mark spends over a third of his gospel on the last week of Jesus' life here on earth. A third of his gospel is spent recording and writing and telling us all about what's taking place as we should be most concerned, brethren, with what is happening there. His final week, we're going to read together here and study together for the next little while. Look back there at Mark now, if you would. Let's begin our text as we've laid the groundwork for this most important information as the Lord Jesus here in verse number 1. Look what it says there. Look at uh, Mark chapter 11. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth his two disciples. Mark begins his narrative by telling us that the Lord Jesus Christ, as he is preparing to go to Jerusalem, is moving through, and this is this is the idea, right? Through two little villages near the top of Mount, Ol Mount of Olives. He's actually up on the top of Mount, the Mount of Olives, about 2,600 feet above the city of Jerusalem, and he's in these two small cities as he's preparing to go down into Jerusalem, that wonderful triumphal entry that we're going to see him make as he does that. Now that word, Bethage, is most interesting to us. It literally means a house of unripe figs. Isn't it interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ is up on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to be going down into the city of Jerusalem, amen, and he leaves from the city called the unripe fig city. It's an amazing thing. In fact, we see this, brethren, don't we? Just jump ahead with me to verse 12 of Mark chapter 11. Let me show you this. Again, as he's preparing to go down into the city, look at verse number 11 or 12 there of Mark chapter 11. And on the morrow when they were uh, come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a what? A fig tree afar off having leaves, he came and it happily he might find uh, anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for the time of the figs was not yet. Listen, this is so prophetic and so powerful what Jesus does. Verse 14, and Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat, uh, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Look at verse number 20, again dealing with the fig tree. Look at verse number 20. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from its roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou curses is withered away. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, Have faith in God. This is amazing, brethren. When you understand what's happening here, Jesus, who's going down to the city that he loved, to his own very people, brethren, he says, I'm leaving from these two villages, one of which means unripe figs, because they, for sure, brethren, were not. And I like how one pastor put it. The people were looking for a crown, but failed to see their need for the cross. They cried for a political freedom and cared little that they were in bondage to sin. In fact, we know what Luke records. In fact, I want to turn there quickly. Look at Luke chapter 19. Look what Luke records concerning this incident, again, the Lord Jesus Christ, his love for his people. And uh, we see that there, Luke 19, look at verse 41. Look what the Bible says there again. He says, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if thou hadst known even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. 
For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast the trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and the children within thee, they, uh, within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest what, not the time of our of your visitation. And we know what this is. This has to do with when, when the Romans came in in 70 A.D. and totally obliterated totally obliterated the temple and, and all that was around it. But Jesus here, the Bible says he wept. He's there looking and he says, here's my people and they don't even know the time of my visitation. Amen. They are like figs, unripened, unready, and unwilling. It really is quite an amazing thing, brother, when you understand that. Now Mark goes on, and we're, this is really, as we continue on here, look back at Mark chapter 11, as we continue on with this wonderful narrative, he says there in verse 2, we're going to read verses 2 through 6 together here. We'll kind of tie them all together and then work our way through them. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says first in verse 1 that he sent forth his two disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereupon no man sat. Underline that, that's very important. Amen. Whereupon no man sat, loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord, underline that, hath need of him. And straightway he will send him hither. Verse 4. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without any place where two ways met. And they loosed him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, Why do ye loosing the colt? What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto him, Even as Jesus had commanded. And they let them go. Now, brethren, again, most importantly, it's very, very important here. We all know, listen, we have seen the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that he is God. <laughs> we've seen miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. We've seen healing. We've seen dead people rise, raised from the grave. We've seen all of these things. Jesus has by far, brethren, taught us and showed us through the gospel of Mark that he was God in the flesh. We see again in Scripture, this is what's important. We see in Scripture that Jesus has the same attributes as God the Father has. An attribute means this, having the same qualities, the same traits, the same characteristics, and the same distinctions. And for sure, brother, we see this in this wonderful portion of Scripture. The first thing I want us to notice, brethren, is how explicit and detailed these instructions are that Jesus gives to his disciples. Now listen to me, brethren. Again, the Bible has been under attack, and it continues to be under attack, and it's still under attack. In fact, there are many devilish writers, many Bible deniers, many Christ haters who have written that the reason Mark recorded this the way that he did is because he had already went and talked to the owner. He had preordained it to happen and talked to the owner, so it was all set up before... The disciples got there. Now, brethren, that is just sheer devilish nonsense. It really, really is. We see here the omniscience of God. We see here Jesus Christ is God, the attribute of foreknowledge. Let me ask you something. Turn with me in your Bible. I want to ask you this. If, if, if this is the case here, if, if Jesus snuck off in the night and met up with these guys and said, hey, I'm going to come and get this colt and, uh, you know, my guys are going to come and just, just, just let them go. I wonder if Jesus had this same conversation with this fish that we're going to look at. I wonder if the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God, who is omniscient and knows all things, had a conversation with this fish that we're going to look at. Look at the specific details here. Look at Matthew 17. Look at here. This is utter nonsense. This is utter diatribe and uh, some other words that I can think of, brother, that he went... He did preordain it, but he did not sneak off into the night like they accuse him of. Let's see if he snuck off into the night and did this. Look at Matthew chapter 17. Look at verse 24. Matthew 17, look at verse number 24. Look what the Bible says. And, they were, and when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus anticipated or prevented him saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? 
Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto them, of strangers. Peter saith unto him, then are the children free. Verse 27. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou out to the sea and cast a hook. I want to know how many people here think you're just going to go to a sea and cast one hook. One hook. One time. Cast the hook. And look what he says. Cast the hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. So we're casting a hook. We're in a sea where there's millions and millions and millions of fish everywhere. Did Jesus have a conversation with this one fish? Because look. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of what? Money. Take and that, that take and give unto them for me and thee. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. When he tells his men to go, to gather this donkey, to grab this colt, and when the men say to you, what need this? He is God, omniscient God, who is working his perfect plan as Jesus again is preparing to go to Jerusalem. Again, God, brethren, is not going to leave any of this up to us, up to men. He can't do it. Just like when they built the temple, you can't do it. You are not wise enough or smart enough, none of us are, brethren, to see how God's perfect, wonderful plan has come together. That divine plan that he put together. Let me show you one more. We'll look at it later in Mark. Look at Mark chapter 14. Again, here's the Lord God himself, omniscient uh, beyond measure. That's why, brethren, when we get to Mark 13, this is, I'm, I'm actually kind of laying some groundwork for it. Because, again, the liberals attack Mark 13 and say Jesus didn't know the hour of the day. Oh, yes, he did. There's a reason why he said what he said. But it wasn't because he didn't know it. Again, Jewish hats have to come on to understand that, have to understand the wedding and how it all worked. But look at Mark 14. Look at verse number 12. Look at here. Look at this detailed description of this meeting. Verse 13, and he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there uh, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. All right, well, the Lord God, listen, he arranged this all right. He preordained this all right in history. It's going to happen because God preordained it to happen. It was God's working. This is why he could say, Go find the man with the picture and follow him. Look at here, verse 14. And wherever so uh, he shall go in, say ye to the good men of the house, the master saith, where is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There go make ready for us. Look at verse 16. And his disciples went forth and came into the city, and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. Again, we see the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God, who is on a mission. He knows all things. He tells them, go get this donkey. Amen. Let me just show you this. Again, attributes, having the same characteristics, having the same dis distinctives, the same kind of person. That's what it means. Look at Jeremiah. Just an Old Testament verse here quick. Look at Jeremiah chapter 32. Again, God and Jesus having the same attributes, the attributes of foreknowledge. Look here at verse number 6 again. Look at verse number 6, Jeremiah 32, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shelium, uh, uh, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anabath, uh, for the right of the redemption it is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anatha, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for yourself. Look at, then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Again, we see here the Lord God giving his prophets the ability to see the future, having, having the ability to say, this is ordained of God. This will go exactly and perfectly as I have ordained it to be. God did set up the donkey. God did line up the fish. God did line up the man with the pitcher as they followed him. But it's because he is sovereign and because he is all foreknowing. He is all powerful. God, as Dean prayed earlier, concerning the weather now. Look at here again. We've, we've seen so many times the Lord Jesus 
Christ as creator, speaking things into existence, controlling nature, stilling the storms, and all of these things, having complete sovereign authority and power over creation and everything in creation. And we're going to see that here in verse number 7. Look at verse number 7. So uh, we see there, the disciples have come. They've grabbed the colt, even as Jesus commanded them, and they went, and they've come back in verse number 7. It says this, And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. Now, brethren, according to verse 2, this is important, that's why I said to underline it, according to verse 2, Jesus said that this colt has never been sat on. Look at verse 2 there. The Bible says there, And ye shall find a colt tied whereon no man has sat. Loose him and bring him. Why is that so important? <laughs> Anybody here ever tried to climb on a wild donkey that's never been broken? <laughs> I would imagine we could probably have some, 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 some Westerners here that might understand what that means to get on a... You ever tried to climb on a horse that's never been broken? Brethren, listen, this is sovereign God. This is the Lord God saying, I want you to get this donkey, and I want you to find one that's never been sat on. And when you bring him here, I'm just going to simply sit on top of him because I am God. I control nature. Hey, listen, you think this is a big thing, right? And it is a big thing. How about Peter telling us that wonderful biblical truth about another ass that spoke? Uh, think of that for a moment, brethren. You got the prophet riding on the donkey on the ass, and the donkey sees the angel. The man's totally blind to it, and the Bible says there, Peter, when he recorded, he says, and, and, the, and the dumb ass spoke. He spoke. Here we have a donkey, an ass, whom the Lord Jesus says, you go, he's unbroke, you bring him to me. In fact, uh, that donkey, that ass, submitted itself to the Lordship and yielded itself to the Lordship of Christ. Look at verse 3. And if any man say unto you, why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord need, hath need of him. He submitted to the Lord God. Donkey, an ass that is unbroken. And the Lord Jesus simply sits on top of him. Which again is so absolutely important. You ask, why is it absolutely necessary that the Lord Jesus ride an ass that is unbroke into Jerusalem? Why is that so significant? Why is that so important, brethren? I'm glad you asked. Again, we started out this morning, brethren, seeing God's, how specific and precise he really is in typing the Lord Jesus Christ and bringing these feasts about as we're going to watch unfold before our very eyes. Again, this is so important. Most of us know this passage. Look at Zechariah chapter 9. Again, one of those things that separates the Bible from every other quote-unquote holy book out there, every one of them, brethren, every last one of them. I don't care if it's the Book of Mormon. I don't care if it's the Pearl of Great Price. I don't care if it's if whatever other holy book you want to talk about. What sets the Bible apart from every other one of them is what we've been talking about this morning, and that is fulfilled prophecy. That is God saying pre-written history. That's what prophecy is, uh, partially. Pre-written history Say, for instance, the virgin birth, the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was written of in Psalms. It was written of in Isaiah. And we remember, don't we, that when the book of Psalms and the book of Isaiah was written, crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. And Psalm 22 is all about the crucifixion. It was a thousand years before Christ was crucified. That was written. That's what it is. That's pre-written history. This is God giving his prophets and his people the ability, brethren, to write concerning things about the future that will without fail happen. This is why it's important this morning. Look at Zechariah chapter 9. Look at Zechariah chapter 9. Look at what God said. The Bible says there, Zechariah 9, look at verse number 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the fowl of an ass. Brethren, what the Lord Jesus did with his omniscience and great power was simply 
fulfill scripture concerning this. Every jot, every tittle, every little detail will be fulfilled perfectly. And we see this here in the Lord Jesus Christ when he gets on there. Again, the reformer says this, brother, let me remind you. The reformer says this, that not only does God have a plan, but it is a very specific and a very divine plan that encompasses all events. Even as Spurgeon said, for a grain, for the grain dust doesn't hit the floor apart from his perfect will. And we see the intricacies of the Lord Jesus as he begins to enter into the city, as he leaves there, again, fulfilling a prophecy that was given to Zechariah that he will come riding on the fowl of an ass, a donkey, an unbroken one at that, as he controls nature because he is the Lord of all. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it wonderful to know, brethren, that God, who is omniscient and all-powerful, controls your very uh, breath, your very destiny, your very life itself. And we see how intricately involved he is here with all of this. Again, unwilling and would never leave it up to fallible men. Now, let's go here together back to the Gospel of Mark. So we see, again, these important biblical principles at work. Uh, as I always like to say, there's much more going on in the economy of God's eternal heaven than meets the naked eye. And there always is. There's always God working things according to his perfect plan uh, as he sees fit, which is really quite an amazing thing. Look there, if you would, at verse number 8. So we've seen a lot, brother, and again, you could go so deep down into this, um, uh, but uh, we'll hit the waves here. Look at verse number 8. Look what the Bible says. Mark chapter 11. Look at verse number 8. Look what the people do. Their actions and their words are very, very important. They are, what, what does that say? A, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Their actions and their words, brethren, speak volumes and speak loudly for us to see. Look at here, first of all, what they do. Look at verse number 8. And many spread their garments in the way. And others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them or spread them in the way. As their king, their Messiah, rides in on the ass, again, we notice their actions. Now, you have to remember that the city of Jerusalem roughly had an average population throughout the year of about 80,000 people. So about almost like Bismarck, you can envision that, about 80,000 people this time of the year. This, where their king is being brought to them as he's riding on a donkey, there were millions of people there. Millions, as they have come, as God commanded them to come and to keep the Passover meal, there were upwards of three to four million people in the city of Jerusalem. You think about that for a moment as he comes and presents himself there. Watch their actions. It was customary, brother, look at it again. This is what's important. It was customary for people in the east to welcome a king, to welcome a conqueror, to welcome a deliverer in such a way. This was the action of somebody who said, this is the king. This is the deliverer. This is an action, again, in the, in the east that they would often do. Let me show you an example in the Old Testament of this. Declaring him to be king by their own actions. They don't even realize, brethren, that they are declaring the Lord Jesus Christ as their king. It's an amazing thing. Look here, if you would, at 2 Kings. Again, we need some Old Testament. Uh, brethren, this is why you don't unhook from the Old Testament, as I always say. You mustn't. You cannot. We get some very, uh, how should we say, some, some inspired commentary on what's happening to understand their mindset, to understand what they're actually doing. Look at 2 Kings chapter 9. Look at here again. Just one example of what I'm talking about. And again, probably a very familiar uh, biblical truth to us. Look at verse number 10. Uh, of course, um, this is a wonderful thing. And the dog shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. So he's giving a prophecy here concerning Jezebel. And you remember what happens later on in the chapter. If you go over there and you look and see the dogs come and eat Jezebel. Do you know what he, you know what's left behind? Do you remember what was left behind? Do you remember what it was? 
When the dogs ate Jezebel, they ate everything but her skull, her feet, and the palms of her hands. It's amazing. Again, we don't have time to go there, but if you look there, you'll notice that each one of those three represents her wicked actions. Her skull was wicked thoughts. God left it. Her, her feet were wicked, the wicked walk that she walked in. She was an evil woman. And then the palms of her hands was the wicked servant. She was wicked. God says, I'm going to have the dogs eat everything but the skull, the palms, and the, and the feet. It's an amazing thing. But listen to what the Bible says in verse number 11. Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord. And one said unto him, Is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto them, Ye know the man and his, com and his communication. And they said, It is false. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and thus spake he to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Have I anointed thee king over Israel? Look what they do. Look at the actions. And they hasted and took every man his what garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew with trumpets, saying, Jehu was what? King. This was the action of Jewish people declaring as the Lord Jesus Christ is getting ready to ride in on this ass. They put they straw the straw. They put uh, their, their coats upon the donkey as he sat upon there, declaring with their actions, he is our king. He is the one. That's why this is so significant, because we remember, don't we, what an amazing thing it was. Right here, we're hearing great songs of joy. They're strawing on the, for the Lord Jesus. They're declaring him king by their actions. And not only their actions, but look at their words, brethren. Look back there at Mark chapter 11. Look at verse number 8 again. Not only are they declaring him king by their actions, by strawing their garments and doing the things that they would do in, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East back in those days to declare the king. Look at also their words. Look what he says there in verse number 8. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and straw them in the way. Look at verse 9. Look what the Bible says there. And he came and went before, and they that followed cried, saying, What? Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Look at verse 10. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Again, brother, not only by their actions were they declaring him king, but by their words. You understand here, brethren, that during the Passover season, during the time that we are talking about right here, right now, during this time of the Passover season, the Jews would recite loudly and they would chant Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. This group of Psalms is called the Hallel. This is what they would do. They knew these Psalms by heart and they would recite it over and over and sing it over and over again. And here they are singing to their king, not only by their actions, but by what they're singing to him. Hosanna. Oh, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Every Israelite knew these words by heart. And the Jews recognized Psalm 118 as one of the greatest of all of the Messianic Psalms that were written in the Old Testament. Look at Psalms 118. Look there with me if you would. This is what they were singing to him. This is what they were doing by their words and by their actions declaring him to be king. Look at Psalms 118. Look there if you would at verse... 22, Psalms 118, look at verse number 22. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 24 that often gets misquoted. Uh, I, I mean, I get it. The Lord makes every day. But do you know what this psalm is specifically speaking of? It's speaking of the day that we're reading about. This day... The one day that the king would come and be presented to his children or to his people. Look at verse number 24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We rejoice and be glad in it. Look at verse 25. How's that start? Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed, listen, is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Do you see that there? We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God, he is the Lord. 
This is what they're singing, brother. They're singing Psalms 118, this specific day that God had preordained in history and in time. We are now seeing it unfold right before our very eyes as their king is brought to them. And he's riding to them low and meek and mild upon the fowl of an ass. It is stunning, brethren, to see the depth of what this means and what they're actually doing. We remember, as we're going to stop right here this morning, because I want to pick up verse number 11. Lord willing, in a couple weeks, Brother Dean will be preaching next week. We're having the Lord's Supper, so please let us gather together around the Lord's table together. But I want to take verse number 11, brethren, because there is much there that we must understand. Again, to understand the feasts of the Lord, to understand precisely when the Lord Jesus was crucified. We've got to understand that the Bible says that he came into Jerusalem in verse number 11, and that is very significant. This very day, this very second, this very hour, this very minute, God ordained for him to go there. And why is that so important? Because we're going to see next week as we close. We will see next week that the Jewish people were commanded by God to choose a lamb. And it's called Lamb Selection Day. And what they would do is they would choose a lamb and they would watch it for five days. This is what's happening, brother. <laughs> when Jesus enters Jerusalem, we will see this next week, it is on exactly the Lamb Selection Day as the Jews were looking for their lamb, and they would watch it for five days. Is there any mark? Is there any blemish? Is there anything at all that would cause this lamb to not be slain? This is the day that the Lord Jesus walks into the city of Jerusalem. And you know what the Jewish people are doing? They're calling him their king. They're, they're, they're calling him that in their actions. They're saying that. And you know what they're doing as he goes into the temple? They're all watching him, all of them. They're staring. They're staring at the Lamb of God on Lamb Selection Day. And we're going to see that next week. This is so amazing and wonderful to see that God would be so gracious to us that He would reveal this to us, that we can look at Scripture and go, Yes, I know now as I follow the feasts that Jesus is fulfilling each of them as He goes His way. And it all begins, as we're going to see in a couple of weeks on Lamb Selection Day. This is where he's at. This is where he's going. And in just a few days, he will be slain as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Precisely and exactly as the Passover lambs are being slain in Jerusalem, millions of them, blood flowing in the streets, as uh, the Jewish historian Josephus wrote, Blood flowing in the streets at that very hour, you know where our Savior's at. He's on the cross being slain for the sins of the world. It's amazing. It's stunning. It really is. What a wonderful biblical truth that we can glean about our wonderful Savior who came and died and shed his blood and rose again for his sheep. What an amazing, wonderful thing to behold. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you again, thanking you for your word. And Father, we proclaim together this morning as brothers and sisters in the Lord that he is our king. And Father, we say that with our mouths, and Father, may we also follow through with our actions. May we as the Lord works and as he transforms us into the likeness of his Son. Father, we thank you for this wonderful word, this word that never changes, this word that is so powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword. Father, we thank you for that and thank you for how wonderful you are. As we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the feast as we move along, we're going to delve into the, into the six trials that took place. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Six mock trials of our Lord. And three of them by the Jews, and the Jews condemned him and everyone. Three of them by the Gentiles. Think of this. 
In fact, Pilate's words and Pilate's wife's words ring deep in our soul. I find nothing wrong with this man. And yet the Jews insisted. The trials, they found him guilty and condemned him to die. And Lord, again, that is your sovereign hand, your precise working, your foreknowledge at work. And that's much more than just knowing. It's foreknowledge is much more than that. Foreknowledge is an action, it's a verb. This stuff all takes place because you see to it that it takes place. And Father, uh, we thank you for that. Thank you for the love of our Savior, that he would, even now, as we see him, uh, as Mark, under the inspiration of God, records the final week of his life for us. Father, I pray that you'll draw us in, draw us into the depth of the love of Christ. Father, if our hearts have grown cold, will you use it to draw us, that we might return as the gospel, or the revelator John wrote, return to your first love. Father, will you draw us there through the word of God. Father, we pray for those who are lost, those who are on their way even now to a devil's hell, those who are rejecting Christ even now. We know that there is the elect of God yet to be called with that effectual call. And Father, we pray for them that we might be long-suffering with sinners, that we might be bold and preach the gospel to them and yet be compassionate on them as you were. Father, help us to, to be sound Christian people, followers, not friends. Uh, well, yeah, we're friends too, but uh, much more than that, followers. They will be followers of Christ. Father, thank you again for those who are here this morning and those who are watching and those who were unable to be here. Father, we thank you for your blessedness, for your kindness, for your loving graciousness to us. We ask now and pray all these things in the mighty name of Christ and all God's people said, amen. Amen. All right.
piece gone this morning and uh, I don't know that I have any original manuscripts for you to look at back there on the wall. I sure appreciate his uh, humor and whatnot, but I want to invite everybody this morning as we, uh, you can probably smell the food wafting through the, uh, through the, felt, through, through the hall here. And so uh, the, the uh, what am I looking for? The sanctuary, I guess. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. And uh, it's wafting from the fellowship hall over there. And so I want to invite you to come. We'll spend a little time together uh, this afternoon for just a little while. I uh, want to make sure and uh, remind you of that. Also, uh, next week, as I said, we'll be gathering together on the Lord's table. Looking forward to that together and uh, celebrating the Lord's death until he comes. So please, uh, please uh, be examining yourself, amen, as we always ought to be, amen. We should be looking and at the word of God, examining ourselves concerning where we're at in our relationship with him and, uh, and where we're at with uh, some of the other things going on. Uh, next week as well, oh no, two weeks from now, uh, the chapel service at St. Gabriel's. Uh, the Lord's given us a great opportunity to go in there and preach. And so if you're interested, we'd love to have you come sing with us. They, they, they probably would like to hear somebody besides me singing, amen, which is really scary. But uh, anyway, so just an opportunity there for 1030. We meet over there and uh, Brother Chance has been preaching on a regular basis there. He's done a really nice job. And uh, so and then uh, also December 14th, we have a leadership meeting um, that reminds me. Um, this morning. Thank you, everyone, for uh, turning in your uh, elders' nom nomination forms to me, uh, going through those. And um, Lord willing, it won't be long, and uh, just in a very short period of time, we'll have, uh, we'll have our elders in place, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. So continue to be praying for that as well. Pray also for the, the church has really been, really been seeing some wonderful work that the Lord's been doing within our own fellowship, our own uh, the church itself and so I just pray the Lord will continue to do that as we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior all right I think that's everything that I can think of anyway so uh, with that being said I'm going to ask brother Daryl if you would if you'd uh, bless the food and then close us in prayer and then we'll be dismissed to fellowship over the fellowship hall Amen. Heavenly Father thank you again for this time that we get to be here today in your presence uh, worshiping you Thank you for the message today and just the amazing plan that you've put in place through your word and allowed us to partake in and understand that in that you sent your son to fulfill all the prophecy that no one else could mm -hmm. and how many times mm -hmm. it does it so perfectly unlike any other. Uh, we thank you for just opening our hearts to your word today and uh, we ask that all of the knowledge and the wisdom brought before us would be something that encourages us mm -hmm. to spread your joy to others uh, we thank you again for the safety and those who were able to come today and also ask for continued safety for those uh, such as Keith that are will be traveling home mm -hmm. and we also thank you for this meal and uh, ask that our fellowship would be sweet and encouraging mm -hmm. and honoring to you we pray, Lord, in all these things, uh, that it would be for your glory. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right.